This is an open letter from you and me together. Tomorrow's in our hands now. Find the words that matter, say them out loud. I'll make it better somehow. Mm. Looking down from up on the moon, there's a tiny bloom on my bow. We are asking folks to come and take a stand with us. The drill pad of the, the Line 3 Tar Sands Pipeline is right next to the Mississippi River. It's imminent. Come stand with your people. Come stand for your water. Stand for future generations. We need your help. The credits maybe didn't show, but thank you to everyone here who, 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 who participated in that. Thank you, Alicia. And everyone, thank you, thank you. Um, welcome everyone to, oh, oh, let me start my video. Sorry, that's the problem with turning off your video if you have to turn it back on. Um, welcome everyone to 350 Madison's um, meeting for April. Um, we started with that video because we are in the middle of, oh no, what it's called, that, that week which goes from April 1st to April 9th, um, Build Back Fossil Free. 
um, week of action. And at 350 Madison, we kicked off our week of action back on April 1st. And we had a sort of a, 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 a premiere, saw that video as a premiere and also saw a um, skit, which was actually performed on April 1st and actually shown on April 1st, which kept Alicia very busy between the six hours between when the skit was done. And you'll have an opportunity to see that skit if you stay on at the end during the breakout sessions. Um, so we're gonna start and end with this because we're our April 5th is in the middle of this week of action. But let me go to my next slide. Oh, before we go too far, I always like to get a moment to um, stay grounded. And so as we look at this picture of green growth coming out of the ground, let us sit with our feet on the ground, feeling the earth beneath us and collectively breathe in and out. And I want to acknowledge that the land of this Four Lakes area is the traditional territory, the Ho-Chunk Nation. The Ho-Chunk have occupied De Jope, which is their name for the Four Lakes area for thousands of years, watching spring come each year. And when they were forced off the land in 1832, some of them returned to this area and continue to watch spring emerge each year on this land. Okay, next, that's interesting that the slide looks a little different than it did before, but that's okay. Um, so I'm Julia Isaacs. Um, I co-lead the monthly meeting team and I have welcomed you and done a land acknowledgement. And in just a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Millar of the Community Climate Solutions team who will introduce our speaker who will talk about transitioning fossil fuels out of buildings and then we will have a period of campaign updates and actions. So those of you that are new can hear a little bit about what's going on. And those of you that are not so new will also hear what's going on. There's a lot going on with a lot of Earth Day activities. We'll see another video or two, the climate justice video. At the end of the evening, about 8.10, 8.15, we will have, we'll have some Q&A with our speaker right now. And then she can stay on for a little bit. And we'll have those that want to can go into a Zoom breakout room for Q&A with the speaker. And other people can go into a Zoom breakout room to see the Enbridge press conference skit. And newcomers will stay in this main room and be welcomed by Nikki. So next slide, I'm trying to remember, is this where we take it down? Oh, Susan, so yes, we're ready for you to introduce Samantha. Okay, am I? Am I un yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. Right. So um, this evening, we are very honored to have uh, Samantha Williams, otherwise known as Sam. Uh, she directs the Midwest Climate and Clean Energy Program of the National Resources Defense Council, uh, otherwise known by its acronym NRDC. And there she's focusing on furthering policies that cut pollution emissions and accelerate um, the Midwest transition to an affordable, just, and clean energy economy. These are really strongly aligned with what it is we're doing across 350 Madison and very strongly aligned with the Community Climate Solutions team's efforts to help our cities and our county uh, do just that. Um, she's focusing uh, on, on, on what the, it, what the emissions that are coming from our buildings are, first of all, with a quick summary of that. And then she's gonna to move to what we can do about it. Um, because of, there's a lot of the technology is basically here. Um, and if we combine that technology with ever, ever improving efforts to improve energy efficiency, then we can get there. So without further ado, I'm um, handing the, I don't know what it is, the mouse over to Sam. <laughs> to Sam. Oh, and, and hey, afterwards, Susan. yeah. We'll look forward to a conversation afterwards about all these policy efforts that um, we might be able to pursue here, uh, both at the state and, and city level. Thanks so much, Susan. 
Uh, that video was a really hard act to follow. So beautiful, but I'll do my best. Really, really honored to be here. Oh, and thanks for displaying the slides. I uh, appreciate that. So yeah, so I'm with NRDC based out of Chicago, um, a little skip and a jump away from Madison. And uh, I've been talking with Susan and Julia over the last few weeks about this meeting and uh, about how we can bring climate solutions conversations, um, particularly in the building space, more into people's awareness. I mean, this is one of the places in the climate solution space that really hits people where they live, quite literally. Uh, so hopefully you'll you'll find this interesting and, and educational. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A as well. So just a little quick preview of what we're gonna be talking about. We work on a range of energy issues uh, at NRDC, including cutting carbon pollution from buildings. We've been spreading the gospel on building decarbonization as we call it for a long time now, but that's largely been focused on the coasts in California and the Northeast. And about a year ago, we started to take, um, we started to look more seriously in the Midwest. And how do we develop a policy and advocacy framework for this region that meets our unique challenges? We have a really cold climate, obviously. We have uh, a combination of, of purple, red, and blue state dynamics. Um, and there's some, some hurdles to clear as we scale up getting fossil use out of buildings and moving to electric appliances. And we want to also do this in a way that addresses equity and the energy burden for low-income communities. And I'll, I'll talk about that as well in the next few minutes. So sharing thoughts on that tonight, um, I am first and foremost a policy person. So folks know, I will walk through some of the technology. I'm not a technical expert, but I have a little bit of experience with some of these um, appliances and we can talk about those and hopefully um, you know, get at least to the outer limits of my experience with those. But this is really a policy talk and, and trying to educate this group on some of the tools that you might have at your disposal both at the city level and also the state level, level in Wisconsin to, to move away from fossil use in buildings. So the first thing as this slide would indicate is to convey the key strategies for cutting emissions from our whole economies. This is actually the key pillars of deep decarbonization across the economy. Um, we've known what these strategies are for a very long time. As Susan was saying, the technology is largely here um, and we, we really shouldn't wait. So I'm sure that everyone on this call is familiar with the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from 2018. It was a, a, a watershed moment, uh, setting a, a new benchmark for a livable climate of keeping global temperature rise to one and a half degrees C above pre-industrial levels. And to get there, we're gonna need to, to accelerate and deepen our decarbonization ambition. Um, and the, the global target, uh, or what scientists are talking about is net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. Um, but in the near term, we're gonna need to get very, very ambitious in the next nine years by 2030 to cut emissions by half of where we were in 2005. Um, so the core strategies to get there are laid out in this slide. This is what the advocacy community, as I'm sure you all are part of, have been emphasizing for some time now and they were confirmed by the scientific community in that report in 2018. So the first one, energy efficiency, um, the lowest cost uh, energy resource as we like to call it. The second is renewables, and that would include both large scale wind and solar and distributed options like rooftop and community solar. And then the third is, is the focus of our conversation today, electrification of both the building sector and also the transportation sector. Won't be talking about transportation, but that is reflected in this slide. So the, the idea here is to take the increasingly clean electric power grid and quite literally plug everything that we can into it. Most of our you know, consumer goods and processes that rely on oil and gas, we're gonna try to plug them in. So that's cars, trucks, and buses on the transportation side. On the building side, that is appliances that you probably don't think that much about. So gas-fired appliances like space heating, water heating, gas dryers, gas stoves. And in a few minutes, I'll cover the key technologies that we're talking about in the home when you move off of fossils so that you know what we're talking about. Um, and these pillars are mutually reinforcing. I'm sure you all you know, have seen this in your own advocacy. They, they lock together and are, they really do work together most effectively. So for example, um, making your home really energy efficient is gonna be key to getting off of fossil. 
uh, electrifying you know, your gas appliances and keeping costs down overall as, as Susan alluded to at the top of, of the presentation. And so these kinds of connections will appear throughout uh, the decarbonization effort. So putting this in the Midwest perspective and where we need to cut carbon, depending on the state in the Midwest, about half to three quarters of the emissions are coming from electric power generation and from you know, just moving around in our cars and, and public transit combined. And then buildings are a close, a close third. Um, direct on-site combustion of fossil fuels is really what I'm referring to here. Uh, it, it does rival the emissions from the ag sector and from industry in Wisconsin. They're a little bit about the same, but it is a place where we have an opportunity um, to take some action at the local and the state level. So next slide, please. I want to show a few more slides to drive home the importance of moving off fossil use in buildings in our region and, and in Wisconsin. This slide um, was kind of a, an aha moment for me when I first saw it, that we have only 10 states in the US that are responsible for over half of our emissions, direct emissions from buildings nationally. When I say direct, I mean, all of the on-site gas appliances that you use. Um, so not your electrical use, you know, just the gas. And Wisconsin is on that list. So uh, four of those 10 states are here in the Midwest and you see Wisconsin with the red arrow below. And so what that means um, and what this really was the aha moment for me is that cutting emissions from buildings in the Midwest will have a big impact nationally and we can have, um, you know, sort of an outsized, uh, impact across the decarbonization work. Next slide, please. And then this is um, a showing energy sources in the Midwest for a number of states for home heating. Um, and what I wanted to show here, the gray bar is gas use and the, the dark blue bar is electricity and gold is propane. Um, all, there's a bunch of Midwest states on the, the left-hand side and all the way on the right is the US average. So we are using more gas in our buildings um, for home heating than typical for the rest of the country. That's not surprising. Again, we have, we live in a cold climate. Um, this is the, also just the way that our system was built out. Um, but again, I wanted just to show this so that you all could see that we have a huge opportunity here, but we also have, you know, a pretty big mountain to climb. Next slide, please. So this is policy focused discussion tonight, as I had mentioned, but I wanna give everybody a quick primer on the technologies that we're talking about. So you can visualize the shift and how you would power your homes without fossil fuels. Um, so the core technologies, as Susan indicated, are already here. And the ones that stand out um, for me from, a, from an emissions impact standpoint are electric heat pumps for space heating and cooling and electric heat pump water heaters um, the two of those together will really cut the most CO2 emissions from, from homes and businesses in the Midwest. This slide shows uh, heat pump technologies. So this is heat pump space heaters, which can also be used for cooling in homes. And so the basic theory be behind this technology is you get rid of your gas fired furnace, you replace it with one of these heat pumps um, and they are extremely efficient. So this is not new technology. Actually heat pumps have been around for several decades. They, you have one right now in your refrigerator and in your AC unit, but what is new is how insanely energy efficient they are. Um, and there's been huge advancements too in the newer cold climate models that can really effectively deliver um, heat down to even five degrees and can technically go to negative 15. So that's kind of a newer um, generation of really, really cold climate heat pumps. As I said, they're really efficient, about three times more efficient than your gas furnace and much more efficient too than the electric baseboard heat that, that was prevalent in the 80s and probably still exists to some degree in some buildings in, in Wisconsin. Um, so the, the technologies here on this slide on the left is the air source heat pump. Um, so this literally pulls heat from the ambient air um, and uses a refrigerant and a compressor to transfer that heat into the living space. And it uses electricity to power that process. It extracts the heat, it condenses it, and then it distributes it throughout your home. And on the right is the ground source heat pump. Um, you know, similar concept, but instead it's pulling the, the ambient air from the ground as opposed to from the direct air and then distributing it throughout your home as, as well. Next slide, please. This is a visualization of how some of these zero carbon 
and lower carbon technologies can come together in a home. Um, this is just one example of a single family home. Obviously, um, this is not how an apartment would look, but I wanted to show you all how these things do fit together. So um, there's little numbers on this slide, so I can, I can just show you where some of these things are. You have some rooftop solar panels identified, um, marked as, as number one. You have a really efficient um, uh, building envelope and windows and doors marked, marked as two and three. Um, you're using electric appliances. So uh, nine is your air source heat pump condenser. It's outside the home. Um, five is your electric heat pump water heater. Six is your heat pump dry, dryer. And seven is your electric induction stove, um, which has become quite controversial. Switching out from stoves is, is actually what the gas industry has been using largely to um, stop electrification. We can talk a little bit more about that later. And then of course, for good measure, there's an EV in the garage as well, getting another piece of that decarb puzzle into your home. So there's many flavors of decarbonization. You, know, you can be in a home that doesn't have rooftop solar, lots of homes, um, for lots of homes that wouldn't make sense, um, you know, or the, the residents, you know, don't have the resources to install it. And so they're going to be plugged into the grid and getting most of their power from the grid. Um, but the good news is that the grid is getting cleaner. Um, it is beneficial from a climate perspective today in Wisconsin to switch out um, your electric appliances, particularly your, um, your gas furnace to a high efficiency heat pump. It will be um, beneficial from a carbon perspective over the appliances lifetime. And I can send around a citation to that. It's a Rocky Mountain Institute study. They're a really great organization and think tank that does a lot of education on this issue and it would be great to poke around their website. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk about a few more things here. And um, this one is obviously a very important one because this is a policy discussion. So getting to net zero emissions by 2050 and then getting as far as we can in the next 10 years by 2030 to stay within the IPCC targets, um, it's a really big undertaking. So we're gonna need a multifaceted and, and very strategic portfolio of policies to get it done. It will require a combination of carrots and sticks, um, eventually reaching tens of thousands of households across the, the region. Um, it's important to acknowledge that this is going to take time to transition our building stock, but we also, you know, need these foundational policies to get started. So this slide um, lays out a framework for how NRDC at least likes to think about policy and the different buckets of work that, that we um, advocate for in depending on the state that you're in. And yes, that is on the right, that is a comic of a happy heat pump water heater. Um, and he's winning the fight, just so you know. Uh, so the first uh, category of policies I want to highlight is on the, the top of this slide. So stop digging the hole, you know, stop building new homes that have that rely on fossil fuel use. So as I mentioned, transitioning the building stock, it's going to be a big undertaking. Um, new homes uh, will function as built for several decades. And so it's really important, you know, to get that next generation of homes um, as close to zero emissions as possible. And so one of the things that we, we talk about a lot is adopting codes. Um, there is a model code called the uh, International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. This is published on a regular basis um, uh, at, the, at the national level and then states can take it up in localities um, in, in full or in part. Um, I've taken a look at the governor's climate change task force and, and I saw that one of the key recommendations on there was to update the commercial and residential code in Wisconsin, quote, without amendment. And my understanding is that things are several years behind um, in Wisconsin in terms of your code, which is leaving a ton of cost-effective energy savings and emissions um, reduction ability on the table. Uh, the commercial code is stuck in 2015. The residential code is stuck in 2009. So we are at the 2021 um, model code, just to put that in perspective. So that's one thing that if you can get it done legislatively, we recommend. We understand that there is a challenging legislature that you all have in Madison. So obviously take that with a grain of salt. Um, the second piece here to, to look at the local level is stretch or reach codes. Um, that is when you 
adopt a building code at the local level that reaches beyond the version of the code that's been adopted at the state level. Um, again, it sounds like the governor and the, his climate um, uh, task force process recognize this. Um, you would need a legislative change to do a stretch code in Wisconsin. Unfortunately, it looks like you are preempted. But I wanted to mention it as something that's out there that a lot of um, cities are doing. And from a cost effectiveness standpoint, new construction is a really good place to start because it's cost effective today um, to go ahead and, and build new homes with electric appliances because you get to avoid all of these infrastructure costs of hooking up a home to the gas mains, the services, the meters, all of this stuff that takes money. So if you start all electric from the beginning, it's actually quite, quite cost effective. There's another RMI study, Rocky Mountain Institute that talks about this and they use Minneapolis as the cold climate proxy for the region. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. I'll send some um, sites to that later. Um, the next piece on this slide, which is transforming the market, is really about existing buildings. Acknowledging that, uh, you know, in some places we're not going to get a lot of new buildings built. We're really dealing with an existing building stock. It's really critical that we get this technology. These technologies are the electric heat pumps and um, heat pump water heaters, et cetera, that I was talking about. We want to get them out into people's homes, build demand, and bring costs down. It's It's not dissimilar from what the rooftop solar industry did a decade ago. And you know those costs have plummeted over the years. I'm sure as many of you know, probably some of you have solar on your roof. So there's lots of elements of developing this market. One of them um, is demonstration projects. So again, doing as many projects as we possibly can to get this into people's homes, demonstrate that electric appliances um, can improve people's comfort, that they work, um, that they can either keep your bill the same or even possibly reduce your bills, that they can improve health outcomes. And also, you know, there's this whole community of builders out there and building managers and owners that, you know, need to get experience with these appliances. And so demonstration projects are really the way to go. Um, we also recommend looking at building energy performance standards. This is something that I believe Madison has the authority to do. Um, and so this is using the existing building stock and doing either an energy or carbon intensity standard for buildings and phasing that in over time. Um, it does tend to come through in an ordinance and there's different flavors of this, like I said. So it can either be set based on energy star um, and energy usage or, or focused on carbon emissions. There's only a handful of cities in the country that have done this, but it's starting to pick up some steam. So they've done it in New York, in uh, DC, in St. Louis, and in Boulder, Colorado. So one in the Midwest. Um, another uh, opportunity to transform the market is through energy efficiency programs. You all have the Focus on Energy um, program in Wisconsin. And we've seen this as a great place to start to get electric appliances into people's home. Um, you can pair efficiency building envelope measures with these new technologies and do it all at the same time through a program. We have heat pump retrofit pilots underway in Illinois and Michigan. Um, I have no idea if MG&E is open to this, but uh, this is definitely something to, to talk with them about and see if they would be willing to set up an incentive program which would essentially pay developers to go all electric and, and buy those costs down. Um, so that could either be for retrofits or we've also seen new construction programs get off the ground that way. So number three on this list is removing regulatory barriers. So whatever barriers could be in the way that are preventing electrification from happening, some of that could be in an energy efficiency program. Like I said, the focus on, focus on energy policy in Wisconsin is a really good place to start. But you need to look at what the requirements are in that program. Is fuel switching a lot allowed? Are there barriers in the statute? Um, in Illinois, for example, we can credit a certain amount of gas savings and energy efficiency programs toward electric use. And then that gives the utilities a little bit more of an incentive to go ahead and do um, electric appliance retrofits because they can count it towards their energy efficiency requirement. Um, rate design is another place to look at, just the way that rates are carved up and then you pay them on your bill. Um, getting the design of those customer rates right will, will be quite important to realizing 
the customer savings and grid benefits from all these electric appliances. Um, time of use rates are, are uh, an area that a lot of states are looking at. Um, and a lot of these appliances can be controlled. Um, they can be controlled remotely. They can help balance the grid. They can help um, come online at times when the wind is blowing a lot or there's a lot of rooftop solar that's generating. There's a way to kind of pair it with renewables for a really efficient grid. And that's a, that's a newer frontier of all these electric appliances. And doing that rate design the right way is, a, is an important way to do it. Um, just another note here on you know, what you all could possibly do in, in Madison. You know, if you can't get legislation through, setting a target is a really useful signal. Even if it's a voluntary target, aspirational that you'd like to see you know, happen in your community, it signals to builders and manufacturers that the city wants to move towards electric appliances. It's, it's a really good place to start. Um, and you know, is something to, to measure progress against over time. The last thing on this slide is the gas transition. You know, we have a lot of gas use in the Midwest. You have a lot in Wisconsin. Um, this is a bit of an awkward part of the, of the discussion, as you can imagine, uh, about moving away from the gas distribution system. Uh, this is obviously, a, there's a worker issue here. And a few states have started to open processes where they're talking more openly about the transition and how to manage the wind down of the gas system and shrink the system over time and protect workers while they're doing it. And uh, in California, they've opened a process and in New York, they're doing something similar. I haven't seen anything like this come up in the Midwest. Again, that's a bit of a third rail, um, but the second we see an opportunity, we'll certainly be talking with a, a friendly gas utility who wants to be winding down their business. That was a bit of a joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, in the meantime, there's things that you could be looking at to help hasten that transition. One is if there's a proposal to extend a gas line to a new part of your city or community, that's a place to focus on electrification as an alternative. And it's usually a lot cheaper than building that gas distribution line and hooking everybody up. And lots of times that's people who, are, um, who have propane gas heat and their so propane heat in their homes and the gas utility wants to come in and save the day and provide gas and, and going in and trying to offer electrification as an alternative is, is a way. Another option here is to manage pipeline replacement. I don't know how this all works at the Public Utilities Commission in, in Wisconsin, but I imagine there's some sort of dockets there where the gas system and gas system investments are being discussed. And so, you know, you could be talking about or bringing up issues and questions about whether we should continue to invest in non-essential, non-safety related pipeline um, improvements. Uh, and then finally, next slide. I wanted to, to highlight a few equity considerations. This is a really big one for an RDC. I know it is for, for 350 as well. Um, it's really important that as we tackle this decarbonization space for buildings that we, we try to electrify multifamily affordable housing as soon as we can. This is a big um, justice issue. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that the prevailing belief is that the gas system is going to get more expensive to maintain. Um, and when you couple that with the fact that folks with means will be moving off of the system to electrify because of personal preference um, or you know, just they, they want to see their emissions go down, you're going to see fewer people covering higher costs of the system. Um, and we certainly don't wanna see vulnerable communities, low-income communities left behind and stranded on a gas system that, that's getting more expensive. And so this is something that we're really trying to highlight that we wanna make sure that um, communities are at the table and are part of these decarbonization electrification discussions um, so that we can help electrify them early. Another reason for this is a health issue. There are um, pretty serious indoor air quality um, impacts from combusting gas in your home, particularly from um, an unvented stove. And there are studies out there, one from Sierra Club with UCLA and another Rocky Mountain Insti Institute study that was released last year that document um, carbon monoxide released from improperly vented 
gas stoves, um, NOx, and other harmful pollutants, which can increase the risk of children experiencing asthma symptoms. Um, this is something the gas industry does not want to talk about. They claim it's junk science. It is not. And it's a really important equity issue for us to be aware of. So there's so much more to talk about here. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Um, I want to just say one last thing. It's not on the slides, but the gas industry is pushing back on this decarbonization and electrification um, uh, movement. And we can cover this a little bit more in the Q&A and breakouts if folks want to, but there's two tactics that we're seeing the industry use um, in the last year or so. The first is to talk about low carbon gas alternatives, like biogas, for example, um, like hydrogen, um, in the hopes of sort of delaying the electrification of um, heating and you know, delaying the, the contraction of their business. Largely, a, that is a false solution. Um, we do think that alternative fuels could play a role, but they're pretty expensive and they're just probably not gonna scale to the level at which we would need them in these cold climates for heating. And the second is preemption attempts. Um, in Wisconsin, you're already preempted, unfortunately, from the, at the local level, going stronger on your code. But in other states, the gas industry, um, led by the, uh, their, their trade association, is I believe it's we're at 14 or 15 states now, bills that would outright obstruct the ability of a city to go ahead and you know, select electrification or move away from gas in some form um, in their residential and commercial buildings. So I will stop talking, um, but so happy to be here and thanks all for, for listening. Okay, let's see. So, all right, so I, I see that the chat does, does not have a lot of questions yet. Um, but we'll start with Don's question. Um, and first of all, Sam, I want to say that was fabulous. Just thank you so much. You've covered so many of the, the key issues that at least um, those of us who are looking at these kinds of issues at the city level are, are already yeah. thinking about. Yeah. Um, so other than benchmarking, says Don, uh, or building ratings in states like Wisconsin where local building standards are precluded, the yeah. preemption point that you were making. What incentives and measures have you seen cities take that have been effective in, uh, in reducing carbon emissions? Yeah, I mean, the biggest one that we've seen is a utility taking their energy efficiency programs or something else like a, a bucket of money they have elsewhere and helping buy down the cost of heat pump retrofits. That's a big thing that's happening in the Northeast. Um, a lot of utilities um, in Massachusetts, Maine, uh, that's really where we're seeing most of the resources come from. And at the local level, you know, you can marshal those resources to help get more electrification in your community. Uh, again, with focus on energy in Wisconsin, I mean, it sounds like you have a pretty limited energy efficiency program. It's kind of small. Yeah. My understanding, yeah. Um, my understanding is that the governor's climate task force recommended expanding focus pretty significantly. If that happens, um, we would definitely recommend that you try. <laughs> Again, I understand that your legislature is um, not very helpful, um, that you try to open up the field for what is considered efficiency and, and try to push for more fuel neutral programs. That will allow you to uh, focus on electrification, not have to worry so much about this, you know, it has to be an electric to electric conversion or a gas to a gas. Another thing that we're seeing, it's kind of infrequent, but it's starting to come up a little bit, is uh, smoothing the path for developers to do low carbon and zero carbon homes. So you could do things like expedited permitting, you could have zoning allowances, whatever it takes to make it more attractive for builders to go down this path because they don't like anything that's more expensive. They think this is more expensive, they're wrong, but they, their perception is that it's going to be harder to unload these homes because people don't understand what they're getting. Um, and so we really have to sweeten the pot for them whatever way we can. So if you don't have all that efficiency money from the utilities, you know, maybe there's something that could be done in terms of your local um, building office. 
Right. Um, okay, so I'll see. The next question here is, um, wow. So we have, uh, we have one of our members who lives in Maryland now, and um, she's, she's, uh, she says that they're about to introduce building energy performance standards legislation. And she wants to know uh, what she can do to push that along and how she can help her myth and friends, friends leverage. Yeah, that would be um, uh, a, a, a good question to ask. And then I wanna follow with one of my own. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot, there's so many great questions in here. There's a whole bunch um, higher up as well. Yeah. So in Maryland, um, you know, what I wonder about that community is what kinds of barriers you're seeing to getting this done? Like, what is the political dynamic there? And the reason why I ask is because to get the building energy performance standards stuff through in St. Louis, we had to de-emphasize electrification and talk more about fuel neutral energy efficiency. And it turns out if you set the efficiency high, it's really hard for gas appliances to, to compete. And so you really kind of call the question of which is better, you know, not just from a climate perspective, but just from a performance perspective. Um, and that helped kind of steer clear of the more conservative arguments that, hey, this is just, you know, trying to turn Missouri into California. So that's just one piece of advice I might give. Um, is that you really focus on the efficiency side of this. Um, otherwise, just give it hell and get people out to city council. As you know, I mean, if you're with 350, you're probably really good at organizing. And my understanding is that they just wanna hear from people because they're gonna hear from the builder community and they're gonna, that, that will be a lot of opposition. As much as you can pack the room with your friends and say that you want this, from so many perspectives, it, it will really make a difference. Okay. Um, so Julia asks about how you would prioritize um, greening our buildings. You, you gave us a lot of policy recommendations and, and it's kind of hard to know where to start there. Yeah, yeah. So is this more on the policy side or which technology you might start with? Julia, would um, you mind clarifying? I would think that you would okay. you'd want to look um, at my thought was okay. oh, go ahead Susan. Go ahead, go ahead Julia. My thinking was of how you would advocate for these on a policy level for all of these changes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um each one is probably a bit of a different forum. Um some of these are legislative. So you'd need to go and unfortunately convince your very challenging legislature to do something. Some of these are at the city ordinance level. And I can, um, I can send a follow-up where I tag each of the things on that policy slide and tell you which ones, where, where they are. Um, so a local building energy code would be, or a building performance standard would be at the local level at the city council level. Right. If you wanna work on energy efficiency programs, that's probably regulatory at the commission where the utilities are regulated and where they put out what programs they're gonna run. So I think the city of Madison intervenes in some of those programs or those, those cases, but I doubt that they really hear much from um, citizens. So it feels like there's an opportunity there. Actually, I can, I can follow up very briefly on that. Um, sure. We have a state policy group now within the um, community climate solutions team and we um, we actually are going to be are, are already a party to the Public Service Commission's um, road roadmap to uh, a zero carbon future, where these policies uh, are going to be discussed in the next three or four months. So um, we we will be a citizen voice coming from the standpoint of uh, a city 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 citizens based in a city environment. That's so awesome. So glad to hear it. I wonder if you could say, and we just have like a minute or two or else Julie is gonna get on my case. <laughs> uh, you could say a little bit about um, where you would start with respect to um, meeting the needs of improving energy efficiency for low-income buildings. 
mm-hmm. low income uh, residential buildings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know that's a tough question in one minute, but. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that I haven't looked at all the focus on energy numbers. My sense is that the investment in low income programs is probably pretty small as an overall percentage. Um, one of the reasons for that is you often don't have community groups advocating for themselves. Okay. And so this is really a process recommendation that we need to have community groups rep- represented right and at the table and helping to des- design some of these solutions. And so I suspect that maybe there's been attempts over the years to bring them in, but that certainly the utilities are not doing a very good job at doing that. So that would be a great, you know, an opportunity for 350 to try to bring that element in and just get more money towards it. I mean, really, this is, we just need more money thrown at, at getting more of this into buildings. I mean, it sounds kind of crass, but that's really where we're at as we try to build the market. Thank you. Um, Julia, I, I'm trying to um, respect your request. It's now uh, 7.45. Yes, thank you, Susan. And thank you, Samantha. Um, thank Thanks, you. everyone. We will, as we always do, we'll hear from some of the, well, we'll hear from different teams what's going on, and then we'll have breakout groups where those that want to and put a one in front of their name and we'll put you in a, in a breakout group with Samantha. Um, if I could have the slides, I actually gave myself a minute for an announcement. And that's for those of you that have met with us in person may recognize, it's not a great photo, but a picture of the Quaker meeting house where we've been meeting in person for four or five years. Well, we are breaking ground on renovating our building And we were gonna go with a high efficiency gas furnace, replacing it, and and people said, no, we wanna be fossil fuel, um, uh, fossil free. And people were like, well, it'd be cheaper. We had this big conversation and our meeting house is, I think we were getting fossil fuels out. We're switching from gas furnace to electric run heat pumps. We have, the, there are panels, old, old, old solar panels, but there'd be more solar panels. And then that parking lot is being dug up and turned into geothermal and then repaved and much better insulation and LED light, lighting and the airlock entries and all the things Samantha was talking about. So assuming when COVID makes it safe and, and better heat, uh, heat, that thing they, to make the air safe, <laughs> that seemed very important to us too, um, air exchange. Um, so we're breaking ground, we think, in a month, and we hope it will be done by Thanksgiving. And I hope that 350 Madison will want to meet in our building again. It is costly. We got someone who really was supporting geothermal that put together really wants to do geothermal. Um, the solar array, I just saw an estimate of 50,000. If anyone, we're writing off a grant, a $4,000 grant for that 50,000, but we're looking for grants and things. If anyone's interested, um, just contact me and I can tell you more, but I'm really telling you, so you know that you're gonna get to see all this. We're not redoing our kitchen because that wouldn't change the zoning of our you know, building permits, but everything else is gonna be uh, not non-fossil free. Um, next slide. That was just my little slide because so many of you might be missing the Quaker meeting house. Um, Gail, tell us about the state policy group, which is so related to this conversation. Yeah, I've, the um, presentation was wonderful for those of us in the audience who are who are participating in the state policy group. Um, as Susan mentioned, there's a relative. This group we've been around for just a few months. But it is really, we are focusing really on the things that were talked about tonight. Um, And state policy is huge in terms of the ability to get fossil fuels out of buildings. And the kinds of things we have been looking at and are looking at, we are looking at the building code updates in Wisconsin. We are looking at getting third party solar approved as a way of getting more uh, solar energy out to people who don't have the means to pay up front for a solar installation. 
we're looking um, a lot at the focus on energy program and um, and and uh, promoting the, its expansion and also looking at how it could better serve uh, low income communities. We're looking at building uh, at uh, building efficiency standards for the WIDA low income housing cre uh, tax credit program. So these are all things that if you are interested, you could have an impact on these types of policies and other pol state policies. Uh, next slide, please. So if this is of interest to you, we actually are meeting um, this Wednesday, the after tomorrow, April 7th, um, uh, from 4 to 5.30. And if you're interested um, in getting on into our Google group and getting the Zoom links and the agendas and all that, please put your name um, and email in the chat. Or uh, you could email me and my email address is, is there and I think it will also go in the chat and I'd be happy to talk to you if you have questions or uh, would like additional information. So thank you. Okay. okay. Oops, I just lost what I was doing. Okay, uh, this is Phyllis. Um, the Wisconsin Conservation Congress was created to access the public's wisdom and to strengthen our influence in the formation of natural resource policy, research, education, and conservation. And the Congress helps inform the priorities of the Department of Natural Resources, DNR. So each year, Wisconsin holds a Conservation Congress where any resident from Wisconsin's 72 counties can weigh in on various issues. Some are related to hunting and fishing and others deal with issues that impact our environment. So this is a wonderful opportunity to show the DNR that the people want no new fossil fuel infrastructure projects like the proposed Line 5 expansion, for example. And um, for those of you who are on the phone, if you can't see the chat, the link that you can go to in order to vote is tinyurl.com slash conservation congress voting, which is all one word. And, um, and it's from 7 p.m. on April 12th to 7 p.m. on April 15th is when you can vote. And you vote uh, in, in your state, I mean, in your county. They count it up by counties. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why does it matter who wins these merely advisory votes? Well, they are just advisory, but the DNR does consider what the Conservation Congress decides. And these votes get coverage in the media and they can influence decision makers like the governor. And it's also an easy way for climate lovers with little time to be heard. So please do vote on this. And the easy way to do it is to go to this um, Sierra Club page that I made a tiny URL for. Uh, and when you sign up there, you'll get their guide for recommended votes on several resolutions and including ones on all no new fossil fuel infrastructure and stopping the Lion 5 expansion. And they'll also remind you when the voting has opened and how to do it exactly and when it's about to close. So um, I hope you will go there and do that. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And I hope it was obvious to folks that the, the link was that we're one statewide group and this is a statewide DNR thing that we can all participate in. And Phyllis is, um, is leads our Tar Sands team. And if you haven't picked up now, we do everything in teams. And Phyllis would welcome more folks joining the Tar Sands team. You just contact her. And I'm gonna mention the Divest and Defund team, which isn't presenting tonight. We also would welcome people. Um, so uh, next slide, we're gonna move, oh, magic. We're gonna move to the well, Community Climate Solutions team. You've already heard from Susan, but I think Julia's making this announcement. I am. 
Hi everyone, my name is Julia De Palma. I'm a co-lead of the Community Climate Solutions Team and a member of the Madison Community Working Group's Alder Election Team Project. I'm here to remind you tonight that the spring election is tomorrow and to please, please go vote. If you still haven't mailed in your absentee ballot, Uh-oh. Amazing work that our Alder election, the city of Madison, to find out their stances on sustainability in the city. The Alder role is particularly important because city ordinances go through them, our state is filled by Alder as well as Common Council. We want to make these changes happen for our future. A lot of it will happen on a local level through our alders. So please go vote. Next slide, please. Okay. And just a reminder, our community climate solutions team meetings are on the third Thursdays. Our next one is April 15th from 5 to 6 p.m. If you would like to join, please contact. <clears throat> that I'd like to highlight is that Kermit Hovey, our other co-lead, was just featured in the Middleton Times Tribunal with an article about the Middleton and Crawling School District's sustainable resolution. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Julia. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, we're going to take a, we're going to have a video interlude after all the, the, this first set of announcements. I'm going to turn this over, I think, to Tannis. Actually, it'll be me for this part. Um, you, Marian. Yeah, Marianne Friedel, I'm part of the climate justice team. And this clip that we're showing is four minutes. It's from the National 350 um, uh, group and it was a training that uh, a number sev several of our members have att had attended. Um, it's a prior climate justice is a priority for the national group and we're just happy to share this with you today um, and you'll be hearing uh, another, uh, another minute or two from us also. So the video can start. Marion, just tell me if I'm in the wrong place, but I think this is correct. It's yeah. the right. It's the right place. Great, Christine. thanks. Thank you. All right, so we're going to dive into some heavy topics, Pam. But we can do it. All right. So, what is white supremacy? White supremacy is the idea, ideology, that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. But just to be clear, white is a socially constructed category of race with no biological or scientific foundation. The racial category white only exists in relation to other racial categories. And the racial category white was created by white power holders to codify the superiority of white people over others. And the, de the definition, definition of it has changed over time and has been, and it continues to be, uh, determined by the people in power. So it's a very powerful social and political construct. Um, and I <laughs> urge everybody to read the book, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism um, by Robin DeAngelo, um, because she identifies these three dimensions of whiteness. And it's really important to understand the structural mm -hmm. advantage um, a privileged person within society and its institutions. Um, for example, did you know that most CEOs of major corporations, political leaders, and heads of large organizations are white? A standpoint from which white folks look at themselves and others and at society, one that allows them to see themselves as individuals, as just human, and a set of cultural practices that are not named and acknowledged norms and actions that consistently create and perpetuate advantages for white folks and disadvantages for black indigenous people of color. Next slide. Okay, 
So what, what is white privilege? White privilege is the idea that white people in America have certain advantages that people of color do not have. White people can choose not to think about race and white privilege does not imply that white people do not have to work hard or that everything is just handed to them. Next slide. So it's important to understand that white privilege is not something that you specifically caused, that you personally need to be ashamed of, but it is something to be aware of and not perpetuate. When white people recognize that they were born with an inherent privilege, they can use that to understand the racial climate and be aware and honor the experiences of others. Um, and this is a great resource in here that you can um, check out later also. It's called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Backpack. Um, definitely a must read um, for everybody trying to unpack that. Next slide. So white folks in North America live in a social environment that protects and insulates them from race-based stress. This insulated environment of racial protection builds white expectations for racial comfort while at the same time lowering the ability to tolerate racial stress, leading to what we refer to as white fragility. So this is a state in which like um, even, even the most minimum amount of racial stress um, becomes intolerable, um, like triggering a range of defensive moves or feelings. Um, and it includes like the outward display of like, emotions, like such as anger, um, fear and guilt and behaviors that are like, is there argument, argumentative um, silence, leaving the situation and not really digging in. Um, and these behaviors in turn really function to reinstate um, white supremacy. Next slide. Was that where I should stop, Marion? I think. Tannis? Yes, that's it. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next slide. So there will be a link in the chat for these sessions as well. This is an upcoming um, opportunity. It's based on the African American history class that uh, 22, I think of us, took. It just ended last week. Um, we're having a couple of internal discussion sessions as well, but um, the Nehemiah Center and their Justified Anger program has also set up three sessions for people to discuss sort of what happens next now that we've taken this uh, African American history class. How can we use what we've learned in our personal lives, in our community, in our organizations? You don't have to have attended the African American history class to attend these sessions. It's they are free for those who um, did attend the class. For those who didn't, you um, are asked to um, pay $20. I think it's per session. Um, so we're excited and uh, we're hoping a number of people uh, attend these and um, share um, with with us here at the climate justice team ways that we can get um, move our climate justice work forward based on our the class and what we learned. Did the chat go in the or did the link yes. go in the chat? Great. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then the last thing is just our next meeting is Monday, April 12th from 7 to 8 15. Email me or Marion. Um, if you're interested, we'll send you the Zoom link. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tannis and Marion, for pulling out four minutes of that of that training. I know that there's a number of 350 national trainings that on Saturday afternoons that some of us are participating in. Yeah. Um, that's being circulated around. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know that Earth Day is coming up. And so we want to tell you about three different Earth Day activities. And the first, uh, Stephanie, is uh, I, this is what I'm definitely participating in. Stephanie. <laughs> Next slide. Great. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Robinson. I'm 350 Madison's Development Director. And we have a fundraiser coming up. We really hope you'll participate. We need your support to power all of our amazing teams and initiatives. I'm going to turn it over to Helen, one of our fundraising team volunteers, to talk to you a little bit about it. In the meantime, I'm going to put our Facebook event link in the chat. Hey folks, my name is Helen. I'm on the events volunteer team and I'm here to talk about the Pizza for a Planet birthday fundraiser. It's going to be April 21st, which is just the day before Earth Day, and it'll be hosted at Ian's at Garber. So you can see the address on the flyer here. There's going to be three options for you to get your pizza. You can order online. You can have it um, delivered if you're living in the East Side or Monona, or you can pre-order for curbside pickup as well. Um, with all those methods, there are different ways for you to um, share your support for us. You can bring the flyer to the restaurant. You can, when you're calling in on the phone, mention 350 Madison. Or if you're ordering online, you can mention or write 350 Madison after your name to, um, to show your support. Our goal is to have 200 orders. So please, please, please share this event with your friends and family. Um, definitely include the Facebook link on our chat so you can take a look at that. Um, and of course, the more um, the more orders we get, the more money and the more money we'll get from the fundraiser. Um, uh, because it's Earth Day, there's gonna be a few you know, ways you can be more sustainable as you participate in this fundraiser. For example, you can bike to get your pizza. You can have vegetarian options or vegan options as well. And for bonus fun, you can share this event on social media. Take a picture with your pizza on Facebook or Instagram, and you can tag 350 Madison uh, with hashtags 350 Madison or Pizza for the Planet. Thank you, Helen. Um, also, hopefully the weather would be good um, and it is possible to um, sit outside on the terrace at Garver and be COVID safe. So um, we hope to see you there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I was just registering on the Facebook page and inviting two of my friends to come eat pizza with me. Um, <laughs> Tannis, is this you? The purple, this must be you. I think it's going to be Nikki. Nikki. Yerga. Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nikki. I am the volunteer coordinator for 350 Madison. And I just wanted to tell you all about the Earth Day scavenger hunt coming up. Uh, this is going to be a four day virtual event taking place throughout Wisconsin. And a number of different environmental organizations are involved, including 350 Madison. Uh, but it's supporting a lot of climate work throughout the state. So it's just a fun, family-friendly uh, event where essentially you sign up for the app and there's a whole bunch of different trivia and environmental action activities you can do. Uh, as an example, there's one that says something like uh, how many plastic bags are um, accidentally recycled and then it tells you to take a picture of your recycling bin with all proper recycling in it, et cetera. Um, it's all missions that are submitted by the various organizations. So feel free to register. I think there's a link in the chat there and it supports us and other organizations that are working on climate within Wisconsin. Perfect. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and last but not, oh, oh. and then we have the, just, that shows that, go ahead. Yeah, that's just what you will see when you go to register on Eventbrite. It's the, the phone, what, what it'll look like on your phone. So we can keep going. Cool. Okay, Carol. Hi there, so last year, uh, just we did a real fast impromptu uh, Earth Day parade with EVs and had about 20 vehicles and some news media there. And this year, it's hopefully going to be a much bigger event. Um, next slide. 
but we're inviting everybody who has an EV or you can find one to beg, borrow or steal to come join us. And everybody else can come watch and cheer or help with decorations, uh, bring signs that, you know, or for Earth Day or that say drive electric or whatever. Um, we're, right now we're planning our meeting on 1.30, 1 30 in the afternoon on Earth Day. And um, we'll be in downtown Madison. We're, we're scoping out which park and which parade route and getting permits and everything. Um, but there uh, in the, uh, I can put it in the chat too, but sign up is at the Dane County Climate Action org on their electric vehicle page and the their office of energy and climate change and renew wisconsin and slipstream are all helping put this together um, it's in the chat i put it in the chat very good very good uh, you know we we wondered about other other vehicles um we're thinking we probably ought to stick to cars this time just because we're not really sure how big it's going to be and how much we don't know if we're going to get a like a police escort or people turning off the lights for us or that sort of thing um so i think this year it's just larger vehicles but i did suggest like in future years adding bikes so hopefully that's something that we'll grow into Thank you for the question, Don. And we couldn't resist putting a few photos in. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Um, so you saw the photos of the electrical vehicle. I see in the chat that Seth actually saw it. I mean, he didn't see it, he saw news coverage of it. Um, well, as we're, um, a couple more announcements. Um, I'm going to turn to Nikki and then Christina, who we should thank for showing all these things. Christina, I think we won't show the last video. I'll just make that announcement. But let's turn to Nikki for this. All right. Just a reminder that if you are not currently involved uh, more deeply within our teams of 350 Madison, that anybody can be a volunteer. And we highly encourage you to get more involved. Uh, it's You don't have to know everything about the climate movement to get started. Uh, and it's very flexible, so you also don't need to, you know, drop your entire life to do it. Uh, right now, we have a couple specific needs that we're really looking for people for. Uh, and we have, you know, different opportunities within all of our teams, but some of the highlighted volunteer teams are event volunteers for fundraising events, uh, things like helping out Stephanie and Helen plan um, the pizza party, all sorts of fun events throughout the year. Uh, and also IT volunteers just to help the organization run a little bit more smoothly on the back end. Uh, we will be having a new volunteer breakout at the end. So if you are brand new and you want to get more involved, just stick around and we'll talk about where we can fit you in. Thank you, Nikki. And I do encourage everybody who's new or just wants to hang out and chat with Nikki to stay, stay at the end for just, just a bit. Um, next slide. So this is coming right up. You may have seen um, announcements from National, but we get so many emails. I just wanted to highlight this one. The Global Just, Global Just Recovery Gathering is coming up April 9th, 10th, and 11th. And you have to pre-register for it. So make sure Let's see, I think we'll put it in the chat. Um, it doesn't magically appear from Mary and I, I'll put it in a little bit. Um, and I really should give a shout out to uh, my fellow team members. Tonight I'm supported by Marion, um, who's doing all the chats and um, Christina, who's just making all the slides and things go, which is, which is just wonderful. I mean, everyone else is doing great things, but they're a little bit behind the scenes. Um, so go to the, the global just recovery, but no, go ahead to the next slide. That's perfect. And um, Phyllis, I think we started, you had the last announcement. We started off with the fossil, Build Back Fossil Free campaign and we wanna end with it. Okay, so 
first, I just wanna say what it's all about. President Biden came up with the great slogan, build back better, meaning that as we recover from this pandemic and recession, we will not just go back to what was normal, but rather build a society that is better. Well, there's 238 groups, 112 of which are national organizations who formed the Build Back Fossil Free Coalition. And they're calling on Biden to make a just transition away from fossil fuels, an essential part of his plan for a better country and world. So when you go to the buildbackfossilfree.org to sign the petition to ask Biden to get on board, you can read the huge number of ways that he can guide us towards a just transition, even without help from Congress. And it really makes me feel very good that we have a plan that can actually work. So now all we need to do is pressure our elected officials to get with the plan, and that's where all of us come in. So I know that you may sign dozens of online petitions a week, but this one is being pushed by a huge coalition for the past month. So it's really worth your while to join tens of thousands of people who are spending time this week reaching out through all their connections to get a really high petition count. So if you do nothing else tonight, please sign that petition and then you'll be offered the chance to announce it via social media. So please use those tools. If you don't use social media, you can just copy some words off the Build Back Fossil Free site make an email and ask your friends to go there and sign it. Um, please take it a step further and contact your congressperson and your two senators and tell them to get on board. And if you don't know who they are or where they are, go to myvote.wi.gov, which is uh, I think in the chat. And if you live outside of Wisconsin, you can use ballotpedia.org slash who underscore represents underscore me. Uh, you don't have to be long-winded or eloquent. You just tell them why you want them to make our recovery fossil free. And uh, we will also be doing bannering to rush our traffic this week with a very big banner that says, tell Biden stop line three. And if you would be willing to hold a banner or wave at cars, get in touch with Russ at bennett.russ at gmail.com. And lastly, you can share the links to the two videos that our art collective made for this campaign. The first one that you saw at the beginning um, and that will link will be dropped in the chat for you to click on. And the second one is the spoof uh, press conference that we did with Enbridge announcing their new solution to the problem of oil spills and that will also be dropped in the chat. So if you haven't seen the press conference video, we will be showing it next in a breakout room and all are welcome. And we'll have time for Q&A if there is a need. Thank you. Oh. There's a picture from our press conference. Yes. Um, they'll go back to the press conference. That's good. I just want, so those of you that have not seen the press conference, um, which happens at one o'clock on April Fool's Day, also Fossil Fuels Fool's Day, um, where there is a video of it, which you have the option to look at. Um, so I'm sorry, Phyllis, I didn't get the, 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 the links to the Love Song on Earth video correctly. Oh, okay. Hi, I just wanted to mention, I put in the chat the Thrive Act because the Thrive Act is also, um, the Green New Deal Network is also encouraging people to contact Congress this week about the Thrive Act, which would, which is advocating for a $10 trillion climate justice, racial justice and economic justice um, um, platform, or I don't know if platform's quite the right name, but um, um, and, and it's led by many, a number of uh, BIPOC groups amongst others. So I just put that in the chat too. Thank you. Thank you. See everyone May 3rd.